You're listening to Tech Recruit, a podcast that educates talent acquisition and recruitment professionals on innovation to attract talent across all industries. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the Tech Recruit podcast. My name is Stacey Broadwell. I will be your host. And today we have the very popular, the very much endorsed to me, Miss Sarah Goldberg. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, we are so very excited to talk. I have so many questions for you, and I know our audience is going to be very excited to learn some of the things that you have to offer. Um, Sarah, you are the sourcing engagement lead for Objective Paradigm, and we're going to talk about that. But real quick, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. They are rated number one in the U.S. You can send your jobs to 100 plus job boards with one submission. You receive thousands of candidates every day and they're all in one place. You can try it free today by going to ZipRecruiter.com and see why over a million companies have already started using ZipRecruiter. That's ZipRecruiter.com. Hacker Earth. Skills reveal what resumes can't hide run accurate skills assessments, and hire developers who are right for the job. Hacker Earth is trusted by thousands of companies. You can start your free 14-day trial today at hackerearth.com. Thank you very much for sponsoring the Tech Recruit podcast and conference. Sarah, back to you. Now, uh, you are the sourcing engagement lead for Objective Paradigm. Tell me what it is that you do. Yeah, so um, Objective Paradigm is an IT recruiting firm. We're a third-party agency, and we offer a variety of services. Where I sort of come in is on the sourcing services. So Objective Paradigm offers sourcing as a service where if you are a recruiting team and you know what you're doing, you can close folks, you've got processes down, but you're just really struggling filling the funnel um, with all that top of funnel activity, you can come in and if you're struggling with that top of funnel activity, we can come in and help out. Uh, We have a bunch of different extremely flexible options from a couple hours a week all the way to year plus long engagements where you'll have a couple sourcers in on site who really get to know, you know, your processes, your your tools, uh, what you're struggling with and help consult on how you can do everything better in addition to actually finding folks um, and My role specifically as engagement lead is I actually have a couple of clients at any one time where I'm sitting in on intake meetings and making sure that we understand, hey, this is the role, here's who you need to work for, Uh, here's who you need to look for, and here's how we can best do it, make sure we're delivering the best candidates and tools for our clients, um, in addition to continuing to do hands-on sourcing. So it's fun, it's uh, flexible, but really great, and I get to you know, source all day. What could be better? Did you, have you always been in sourcing? How did you start your career path into recruiting? I I find like there's always a different path. How did you get started? Right? Like, I'm not sure anyone ever said, ever says like, I'm going to go to college to be a recruiter. Um, So my background is very academic. Um, I studied ancient Greek. So Um, writing on rocks that has survived for centuries is really my jam. Um, And I graduated with a degree from U of C, uh, U Chicago, in classical languages and literature. And I was like, I have no idea what to do with this. It's really cool. I will talk your ear off about epigraphy and, you know, Greek literature if you ever give me the chance to. But I didn't really want to go to grad school, pursue an academic path, so I started just looking for any kind of research roles. Um, came across OP, um, they had sourcing and research, and I looked through the job description, and I was like, databases and Boolean strings, I can do that. I, if I can write a Boolean string that's going to find different tablets that have you know, dialects of different ways of saying various boring proclamations in ancient Greek, I can teach myself the difference between Java and JavaScript and use Google as a database to find those candidates. Um, And yeah, it's been a natural fit so far. It's interesting how you can find that parallel 
in what you went to school and what you're passionate about and find that passion within what you're doing now um, with the research and the being able to transcribe messages into something that's meaningful and you found that and, and you find that satisfaction in that role. I, I completely agree with that because I was a financial analyst previous to doing recruitment and it was a lot of research. It was a lot of like all that stuff we do with the market mapping. I was in the library looking at census reports and like, you know, looking into like business, um, you know, financials. And there's an element to that. Granted on the front end, um, you know, in the sourcing portion, initial research, but you find that, that parallel and you find that um, attraction to it. Um, also, I'm, I'm, I'm more social, but uh, that's so, that's so fascinating. As you were telling me about the Greek literature, I, I have to ask, is there a Greek uh, figure uh, that you liked the most? Um, I got to go with Aeschylus. Um, not necessarily his personality. I don't know too much about him um, as a person, but I did a research project on the Oresteia. Uh, I guess research project literature translation. Um, so the Oresteia is the story of Agamemnon um, and, you know, his adventures and misadventures returning from the Trojan War. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. Um, but it was just really fascinating to me. So I sort of, and the Oresteia is also the only trilogy that has survived intact, um, that we can, this can be an hour long conversation about ancient Greek drama if you want it to be. Um, but the way that they actually, you did warn us, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the way that they performed, um, Greek tragedy is they would have like day long events and they would perform three plays, not always linked. Um, and then they would do a very funny comic piece afterwards. Um, not one of the comedies that we have. Um, but anyways, the Oresteia is the only play that we've got from ancient Greece that we've got all three pieces of. Um, and if you ever look and you're like, oh wait, but you know, Sophocles has some, those are pieces that have been traditionally put together after, after the fact, but weren't performed all on the same day. Uh, that's, there's your useless trivia for the day. Well, you can apply that to recruiting as well. <laughs> the <information laughs> from the hiring manager isn't always there. And sometimes when you get that full description, you're like, wow, it's like an anomaly in history. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's interesting. So you studied Greece. Uh, or ancient Greek and at the University of Chicago. And then you started working in recruitment and, and sourcing right out of college. Yeah. And you, you were like, yes. wow, this is really awesome. Or were you kind of like, okay, I'll do this for a while. And No, I think as soon as I started actually realizing what the job was and the potential for how, um, how you can make it better as an industry um, as well. I mean, not to be, I realize I've only got five years of experience doing it, but um, there are lots of really uh, fascinating challenges for us right now where we've got all sorts of really cool stuff that we can do. Um, and I realized, you know, I get to find people and connect with them. That's a challenge that remains interesting every day. Um, oh, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get to that. I, I, um, you are somebody who has been, you have, you have a um, reputation for being an amazing sorcerer. You know this about yourself? I don't know. I, I'm still a little bit like, I, like, you're telling me so it must be true. Um, yeah. I feel like I just do my job and try to do it the best job that I can. Uh, that's what it's about, right? There was, there was this moment I was like, who do we know in Chicago who would want to speak at Midwest Tech Recruit who can impart their wisdom on our audience and you were recommended to me so many times and it just so happens that you are available and so I'm just like I had all these questions that I wanted to ask you you know because and one of them being um, I wanted to talk about your favorite roles that you are like I'm the go-to person if you have this role my team always like pulls me in and then um, maybe what your, oh, I, I, what do you call it? Your Achilles heel <laughs> to go back to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> the one that you just don't like. Um, what are what are your favorite roles and what's your least favorite roles to work on? Yeah. So one thing that I will say is one like one of my favorite parts about my job is that it always changes. So I'm always there's still roles that I get and I'm just like I've never heard of this before. This is a whole new world to explore. Um, and I love the flexibility of being able to look for new things. Um, I think some of the favorite roles that I've ever worked on have been in the data science world, um, just because data scientists, um, if you can figure out what they're actually working on and, you know, go through different conferences that they might attend or places where they've published, if you can say, hey, I've got a question about this really specific thing that you're talking about, um, they will talk to you. They might not be looking for a new job. They might not ever actually turn into a placement. But you can get those conversations started really easily um, and that and it is pretty clear to say oh you know this is the kind of stuff that you work on um, so I think that would have to be my favorite my least favorite is really challenging because I do I, I really do love you know the go out and find it part um, I think some of the roles that I've had least success with have actually been uh, sales roles um, we work on them a lot and I still can find folks um, but I feel like software as a service sales are probably like the second most uh, roles that we work, most common roles that we work on. Um, they're definitely fun. I can definitely find the folks and engage them. They're just less fun than, you know, data scientists and software engineers. Um, and that, that's interesting. I can, you know what, I feel similar in uh, project management and product management and program management roles. I would say for me, when I get those roles, I get so inundated with every single candidate in the world who believes that they could do that role and they just don't really. And so you're, you're just going through so, I get inundated so heavily with just everything. I, I think that's probably my least favorite role to work on. Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to not just like, you know, the background and the experience and, and what have you, but just their, their personality, because oftentimes it's dealing with teams and it's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had that experience. Yeah. I mean, I don't usually work with folks who are applying, um, just because, oh, right. um, we, we kind of silo it off. So I, I don't, um, I, I can sort of pick and choose who I talk to because it's who do I make the choice to reach out to um, with the knowledge that there's someone else who's going to actually be looking at all of those applicants. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I did work on a pretty challenging, um, I think the challenges that I've had with product program management roles is that the, or product project product is that every different client will have a different definition of this is what a product manager does versus a program manager does and trying to think, okay, what's the background that I actually need to look for? It's so much less clear cut on a lot of times um, where you think, okay, are they going to be executing on a roadmap or setting it or just making sure like, things happen? All of these are extremely important, but trying to find the exact right person is pretty challenging. Yeah. That, that would be my, my challenging position. I'm with you on the data scientist because my background is actually a financial analyst. And so I always had this like, oh, if I was still an analyst and, you know, or what would I be doing? I'd be a data scientist now, but quite honestly, I'm, I'm way more social. Um, <laughs> so tell me when you get those data science roles, I'm curious, like, how do you what's your initial process? You got the role, like how does that come to you? And then how do you begin your search? Yeah, so I get the role, usually I'll meet with the client, do standard intake, you know, tell me about the challenges, tell me about the successes, look for, I always try to find um, whether the client has someone that they tried to get and couldn't, or if I can go and just look and see, oh, this is the person who was in the role now or recently left. I, I love seeing kind of that, sample profile looking through a career path. Um, but then, um, yeah, my first step is research. I will, you know, I'll go to Google, see, make sure that I know, um, especially if it's a new technology, like I want to know everything there is about everything technical on that page. But beyond just knowing, you know, okay, here's how these different technical pieces go together. I think it's really important to sort of understand the career path that someone might take. Um, so I'll try to see, you know, if I can find 
current employees who have done similar stuff or you know talk to them talk to the hiring manager if I can to say what what are you looking for ideally um, because trying to think not just okay what is someone doing right now that might have prepared them for this role but what was someone doing five years ago that's going to put them in a place to be really successful at this role now because when you when you're researching things um, or sourcing there's, it's really easy to focus on like, okay, I need the right now. I need to go to, you know, here's, I'm going to look at people who are open to opportunities, who've got resumes up and ready right this second, and those are the people I'm going to find. But especially if you're working on, you know, experienced hiring, um, going back and saying, okay, where was this person five years ago, 10 years ago? That data is still out there in the world, right? Like that's, um, we still have tablets from 2000 years ago. We still have job descriptions and resumes in the internet from 10 years ago. Um, you have people who, if you are looking for, say, a data scientist who's just got, who's got like, you know, three years of experience with data visualization or something like that, you can go back and look for people who are attending boot camps uh, and, you know, intro to R for data science three years ago. Um, and, go through and say, okay, that person was doing some introductory stuff. There's no guarantee that, you know, they made it through. I'm sure there's always a lot of drop off. People leave, they, they change their career path for whatever reason. But if you're finding folks who don't have a lot of information about themselves online, um, or who don't have a lot of information about what they're doing right now, it, it has paid off um, a couple of times. That's, I so right there, I mean, some things that you mentioned, I mean, um, asking the hiring manager about a sample profile of the person who left or maybe somebody who is even still on the team, looking for people in that company who've had that career path and what they were doing three years ago or five years ago before they got that, and then doing searches on um, that particular skill set, like you said, like those accelerator programs, um, you know, like the intro to R or what have you, and then um, finding where that person might be now. Those are such creative approaches. And then I also like what you said about conferences. That to me, like that is almost like uh, conferences are like taking somebody else's list of stellar people <laughs> And listing them for you. It's, it's, I love looking at conferences for, for, and those are typically really extroverted yeah. people and they're more open to give you recommendations than other people as well. Right. And, oh, and I like what else you said, you, mm -hmm. your opening engagement that I've never, I don't think I've ever <laughs> reached out to somebody with like, Hey, I really like, I mean, yes. Like, you know, you compliment their, their, um, their profile or, or something that they, or some common interest, but saying it like specifically just leaving it like, I wanted to ask you about something that you said versus I want to ask you about something like you said, and I have this position. Of, like, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, no, there's so much information that people put out about themselves online that they just don't get asked about a lot, right? Yeah. Um, so if you go, if you do go through conferences, right, you find people who are speaking at conferences, attending them, that's sometimes a little bit trickier to get the attendee lists than the speaking lists, which are out there in the world forever. Um, but you can say, hey, it, it's um, extremely easy to personalize what you're saying. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Like you can go through, um, you know, every speaker from a conference two years ago and say, hey, this was a really interesting thing that you did two years ago. Want to know what you're up to now? Um, or even, you know, stuff that you're doing now doesn't need to be uh you don't need to just look for stuff in the past um but it gives you an easy way to personalize engagement because you say oh you're talking about this specific thing at this specific place that uh, that's really interesting to me um so you get that it doesn't take a ton of effort if you're going to it from the conference side instead of getting you know here's your candidate that you want to reach out to let's find out everything about them um and it's a way of really just increasing your engagement and showing, showing, hey, you know, I, did, I do care. I did some research into you. I'm not just sending this to 5,000 people. I, I feel also that's something that's going to be more of a challenge for somebody who's in a quote unquote typical agency because they have to 
they have to adhere to that quota. And I started at Robert Half. So I totally like it's quota, quota, quota. How many calls did you make today? Like how many calls are you gonna make tomorrow? You know, and um, to slow down and instead take that extra step to say, hey, let's just engage on a human level initially, which was you know, what Derek Zeller's yeah. gonna be speaking about at the conference. So cool. Um, yeah, uh, like that's, that's really great that that's your approach. Um, yeah, I, I think even at an agency, I, I think even at an agency, you can do that. Um, you can still engage on a human to human level if you just leave some time to like do that networking because that's going to pay off down the road. Like hmm. whether, uh, I, I do think that, you know, even if you do have to hit your call list, um, if you keep folks in, um, if you keep engaging folks and you keep on saying like, hey, this is really cool. This is a project like especially if you've got the right clients for it um you've got you know your profile you know the profiles that you can always place like those relationships will definitely pay off have you had relationships where you met somebody i don't know like five years ago or something and then they like it just comes full circle and yeah absolutely um there's someone like there are a couple of people that i've managed to place where it's like I'm going to message you every three months and you're going to get really an, a, annoyed maybe because I'm going to be sitting there saying like, Hey, it's been three months. Um, you weren't interested then, but just got to shoot my shot. Um, no harm in reaching out. Hope all is well with you. Um, like, and people are always get back and they're like, wow, no other recruiters do this. I'm just like, it's so easy, especially I do. I will say I don't do my three month outreach every three months to everyone that I've ever messaged. Um, but folks who get back to me and say, hey, the timing isn't right right now, like, you need to make sure to keep in touch with those folks, I think. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that brings me to, um, I want to know about the tools that you're using. Because as you're talking about this um, outreach every three months, with the mm -hmm. amount, the database of candidates that you must speak with, it would be so hard to remember every single, unless a Obviously, there are those stellar rock stars, silver medalists, as Dean DaCosta calls them, um, that that you will forever remember. And if you have a position, reach out to them. But how do you keep those in your database engaged? You have an automated email um, system, CRM or ATS that you guys utilize. Um, so yeah, at OP, we use Bullhorn. Um, we don't automate the email. So we automate the reminder to get in touch. Um, which is, I think, an important distinction, right? It's yeah. not, I don't write an email and send it, and you know, three months, six months, nine months later, it's like the same email goes out. But I do have, um, if someone gets in touch with me and someone responds to email, LinkedIn, um, I've gotten a couple of folks through Twitter, actually, which is always really fun. Um, but whatever platform they're using, um, I'll just go and I'll make a note, and I will set a reminder for myself in three months. Um, it's, uh, even if you don't have that, I, everyone these days has some kind of calendar. I think it's worth it to say yeah. like, um, it takes maybe an extra 30 seconds when someone responds to you to put in a reminder that says, hey, reach back out to this person, but it's worth it. I, we used Max Hire when I first started mm -hmm. my agency, IT Talent Search, and, um, and then they got bought by Bullhorn. And I haven't like done the transition yet because I took time off to have my babies. And um, I'm curious, like, how long have you been using Bullhorn? Do you like it? I'm just, I'm just curious. Oh, man. We've been I'm using Bullhorn. Person, so I'm not being for... sponsored by them, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, we've been using Bullhorn for a very, very long time. Um, I think definitely as long as I've been at OP, um, I think, yeah, at least 10 years, probably longer. <laughs> um, I, I'm not even sure if there's a time when OP wasn't using something that is Bullhorn. Um, and yeah, it is, there's a lot to like about it. We can definitely, it's highly customizable where you can say we want this field, we want to make sure we've got this. Um, and yeah, it, it's been working for us. You can't automate, and not that you, you don't, you automate your alerts in what, Outlook? Mm -hmm. Is that, do you use Outlook for your email? Uh, just through Bullhorn, um, you oh. can set tasks. Uh, okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't automate the full email, um, especially because I'm going to be on, you know, 
um, right? Like between email, LinkedIn, Twitter, there are all sorts of different places where I've messaged folks. Um, so it doesn't actually go through and say like, hey, we're going to, you know, it, it doesn't automate the actual sending of the message, um, but it says, hey, Sarah, three months ago, Sarah said to reach out to this person. And then I get that, that in, my, in my inbox. Um, do you email within um, Bullhorn or do you email <clears throat> within like Outlook or another like Gmail? Oh, yeah, I, I usually send emails through Gmail. Um, yeah, I know, I'm super manual. Um, yeah, I use Gmail, but I use Outlook and I'm spread all over and um, I need to somehow consolidate it. So I've just actually had everything go through one account, yeah. but there are still like five different emails that I have. <laughs> like, I know, I know, I need to, I need to tighten that ship. Um, but do you use the full Gmail suite, like Google Enterprise, and, or how do you, do you guys use like um, Google Docs and? Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Um, we, I'm on G Suite, so uh, Gmail, G Docs, spreadsheets, slides, all of that, um, but yeah, we'll also like, I guess if we have, oftentimes for clients, we'll be able to work in their email systems and I'm not going to say, oh, you guys are on Outlook, we're not going to work with you. Um, right. So I've used Outlook before as well. Um, yeah. But. Awesome. Um, so it's, it's really, you said something earlier, and I don't mean to jump back. Actually, wait, before I do that, because I've been wanting to ask this other question, you mentioned Twitter just yeah. now. Um, so you use the bullhorn, you use bullhorn. Um, are you on LinkedIn and do you use any other sourcing tools? Um, yeah, we use all sorts of sourcing tools. Um, I mean, seek out and human predictions both. Um, and then there's a lot of things that we use as sourcing tools that aren't probably supposed to be sourcing tools. Like when you're doing, you know, site searches of Google through um, all sorts of databases that just happen to be online, right? Like, that's not intentionally a sourcing tool. You certainly go to those folks and say, uh, you know, oh, you're running this conference. Are you sure you want to use that as a sourcing tool? Um, but we use that as well. But, um, and then, yeah, I'm trying to even think through all of the different tools that we use, a lot of it is just like, what can we find? Um, what can we find and how can we use it? Um, messaging people through Facebook sometimes. Um, like, you just gotta think, where are people saying, hey, I'm a software engineer, and how do you get in touch with them when they say that? Uh, wait, like on social media? So you mentioned like, you yeah. know, reaching out on social media. Is there, is there a tool you use for that, or do you just do it manually? Yeah, I just, I literally have just like followed someone and then DM'd them like. Yeah. And do you, do you, do you um, ask to be their friend? <laughs> not on, on Facebook. Facebook? Um, not, not on Facebook, that's, that's a step too far. Um, but if you're in, um, sometimes like within Facebook groups, you can build yes. engagement through that. Um, so sort of where people are expecting to get messaged a little bit. Um, but yeah, Twitter is where I've actually had the most success with that. Cause people will actually like, you can set, um, you know, you can search keyword or you can search for keywords, right? So when was the last time you searched Twitter for like hashtag looking for a job? Um, it's, it's definitely, definitely interesting. I had, um, I've had some fails and I had some successes with it when I first started doing the Twitter searches and, and searching for keywords. Cause you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a, a, a hashtag. It will yes. just pick up on words. Right. So I almost yes. wonder like, why do people even use hashtags on Twitter? Cause you don't even need to hashtag it. It'll just find the words anyways. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Right? Because I think there's like an element to it though, where if you look at a tweet very visually, like the hashtags are bolded or colorful. Um, yeah. I mean, other than that, like design factor, but you can you can search any word. Because um, I thought that was the whole thing with hashtags is to make it searchable. Yeah. But, well, um, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry to, to interrupt. Um, I guess it does. If you have a hashtag, you can just click on it and it's a little bit faster. But oh. That's um, true. That's the reason. Yeah. yeah. And it's easier to track, like you can track hashtags and you can sort of run analytics against them too. So I, I guess if you're doing like 
hashtag looking for a job, you're probably not running analytics against that. Um, but I don't know, it's 2019, 2019 social media, how does any of it work? So you do searches for people mentioning Python or yeah. you do you generally just try to, you try titles, do you try keywords, skill sets? Mm -hmm. Sometimes keywords, sometimes I will, um, so if you're doing like a security engineering um, role, you could search, um, DEF CON was a couple weeks ago. So people who go to DEF CON while they're there are going to change their Twitter handle to, you know, Sarah Goldberg at DEF CON. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can search for, you can always search like titles. So you can search for people who are named that and then go through, go through that. And sometimes um, people change their handles. Yes. For a conference? Yes, absolutely. I've never heard of that. That's, so my, my handle is just Stacy Broadwell, but if I were at a conference, I'd be Stacy Broadwell at LAX Tech Recruit or something like that? Yeah, so it would be, it's um, new, it's getting into the weeds here, um, but Twitter recently changed the um, character limits that you can put. So it's not on your, it's on your name. So it's, sure. um, your mind is like Sarah Goldberg. So not instead of at Sarah E. Goldberg, my Twitter handle, if you want to follow me. Um, yes. But you can change the, so you wouldn't change your actual handle, you would just change the name associated with it. Okay, got it. So when it pops up, then you see, but okay, because yeah. I was like, what if somebody takes Stacy Broadwell while I'm, okay, got it, okay. So it's not, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not, it's not your handle. I should have, it's not exactly your handle, it's your name. Okay, uh, you're blowing my mind for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> get protected for those three days um no that's that's uh so okay so you could do the search for people's names mm -hmm. um and i i like that too like at a like people who are talking about a specific conference because anybody who's going to be at that conference of course is going to be interested in technology or coding or mm -hmm. you know i i just did um i i was moderating uh women in data panel at DataCon and it was awesome. all data scientists and engineers and we had a booth and we were completely unprepared for the amount of data professionals who came up to our booth. It was outstanding. Um, so, okay. So on Twitter and okay, so this, I've totally had a faux pas. Like I, I think I tried this five years ago and I found a bunch of people who were talking about a particular subject and I, and I tagged them all in a comment I, and I posted the job. I posted the job and I, and I tagged them all about the opportunity. Oh no. Two of them were like, great, this is a great company. I would love to hear more. And then somebody else is like, is this what Twitter has come to? And like <laughs> got a full rant on me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, Twitter fail. I mean, I've never done it since. I've more been like on the DM now. <laughs> yeah, I do, especially like for things that are just like explicitly, hey, I'm going to try to hire you. Like the only time that I would do that is in a tweet to someone who said like, hey, I'm now looking for a job. Um, okay. Because I think it is a little bit about you're, if you're connecting with someone on Twitter, you're not going to hire them right now. You're probably, I mean, you might in a very, and you know, things can always happen, but you're much more likely, you're gonna start like say, building engagement so that when they are, uh, when they are looking like you're the first person they're gonna think of. Yeah. Um, so sort of more steadily building that up. So would you, in, um, in a way to engage, would you just uh, follow them? And yeah. And like a couple of the things that they're talking about? Yeah, um, and then I've also a couple of times I've like followed someone, liked a couple of their tweets, and then you know the next day sent a LinkedIn message. Um, so sort of engaging them on a couple different platforms at the same time. And then it's like, hey, I'm loving the conversation that you've had about this stuff. I know you're probably not looking because you're having this really amazing conversation right here, um, but you've got a lot of really interesting things to say about whatever the topic is. Uh, would love to love to get in touch with you about. I'd love to teach you more about our culture or get in touch with you about some jobs I've got, I'm working on, you know, whatever your ask is going to be. Mm -hmm. Do you ever come like right out and say, I have this position or do you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all the time. Um, like, the, like when, as we've been talking about like your outreach, like in emails mm -hmm. and like, um, and, and, and Twitter, you, you mostly like initially you don't come out right away and say, I have this, yeah. you know, software engineering position. You're more like, 
compliments and in case you're open to something, but um, do you do both? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I obviously have sent emails being like, hey, That's we're currently right. hiring. That's why I'm looking out. Like, sure. yeah, there is, sometimes it is better to just be direct. This is what, it, this is what's going on. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely have done that. I just also sometimes like to be like, hey, you've got some really interesting stuff to say. And even if you're not interested right now, would love to have a chat just to say what, what's going on. Okay. I was starting to think, I was like, okay, I see the success of Sarah Goldberg is not being direct. <laughs> oh, no, no, I am. Just you have outreach. to. Uh, but no, that is, that is so good. I mean, I really like, it's kind of, um, like that, the initial one you were saying, like, you know, when you're just talking about what somebody was speaking about, how I really liked, I just had some questions, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a way you're kind of feeding their ego a little bit, you know, saying, you know, you're probably not looking, you're just doing all this other stuff. And, um, but you know, and people are probably like, Oh, well, stop. You know, I, I, of course, what do you got? You know? And, um, I, and I think that's certainly like, you know, a, an a approach, but oftentimes you're just, you know, have a role to fill and you got to be a little bit more direct. How might yeah. those contacts come out? Like when you're a little bit more direct? I mean, those are still, I, I still do like, personalize, you know, you describe the role. You say, hey, we're looking for this. Um, I do try like, when it is, you know, not so much pipelining for the future, but like, hey, I've got this right now. I do you usually say like right now this is what we're looking for I get pretty like you know I always try to answer the question like what's making me reach out to you um, like there's always something and even if they're occasionally you send a message to someone on LinkedIn and their LinkedIn profile says like data science at company and that's it like there's nothing else online Sometimes you can spend you know half an hour trying to find everything that they might have ever done or you can say like hey I want to be honest with you. I'm not sure if this role is going to be something that's interesting to you because you have nothing here, but just in case. Um, but there's always got to be, you can always answer the question, why am I sending a message to this person? I usually will just put that right in the message. Um, you know what? I think that you answered that um, question I had in regards to like those, those outreaches with just that statement, the pipelining for the future, Here's the thing, like when you are, I feel like I often get inundated with so many positions that when I hear of people pipelining, I just think, where do they get the time <laughs> to sit there and just be like, oh, I'm pipelining, you know, and I don't have any positions I'm working. I'm going to take this time to like pipeline. And I just like thought, wow, that's such a luxurious thought. Like, you know, to, <laughs> but here then then it's it's really something that you have to work into your whole flow and it yeah. sounds like that's what you do so tell me a little bit like in regards to the current positions you're working on to say um pipelining is there a split like an 80 20 split on how how would you i mean so the thing I guess, yeah, sometimes you are gonna send like a super passive message and that's because you found someone who's really cool. Um, I do try to like spend, you know, um, cause it, sometimes you are like accountable and like you're like, okay, I need to hit this many messages and I need to turn it, turn that into this many calls this week, right? Like that's a goal that I have. Um, and I do think like, I guess, maybe I'm extremely lucky that my clients and my boss have been really like, hey, here are your goals and they're extremely manageable. Um, so like sometimes it will be like, on a Friday afternoon and I've already hit my goals for the week, I'll be like, okay, I'm just gonna go find some really cool people. Um, I guess that might be a little bit luxurious, right? But I do think that <laughs> there is time, like it's not, I guess the thing is you're never not pipelining. Like every person you reach out to, there's someone that like, okay, hopefully it will work out right now, but if it doesn't work out right now, what are you gonna do with them? Um, you should always have an answer and that answer is, I'm going to keep talking to them every three months for a while. Yeah. Um, and then taking that time to like, especially if it's like just like a check-in email, like how long does that take to write? Like 30 seconds. Hey, right. you said that, you know, you're not interested right now, but let's keep in touch. I'm keeping in touch. Want to know what's going on in your life. Um, like that, that element of, you know, maintaining your pipeline, that doesn't take very long at all. Um, that is, it's so interesting because 
as I'm, I was just kind of thinking like my process generally begins that I have a position I'm trying to fill. However, keeping those candidates that I've reached out to um, available for other opportunities is always key, right? And I have just folders from the last 10 years of like how I like put people in like based on their skill sets, whether it's Java or .NET or Python or or InfoSec or, or you know, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and then having that reminder to reach out to them. And maybe like, you know, that doesn't always uh, work out because like there's a lot of candidates, you know, mm-hmm. and how do you like sit there um, do you, and, and send them personalized messages when, you know, the, the, the initial response was so quick and maybe you didn't even have an opportunity to get on, on the phone with them. It was just an exchange of emails. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my pipelining always seems to begin with an initial, an initial position. And then I just have all those candidates I reached out to. And then like, I reach out to them like another time when I have a similar role, um, but uh, then, actually, but you you actually take time, and maybe that's um, uh, you actually take time to source for specific roles, even if you don't have a, a role for them. Yeah, I mean there are things, and maybe just the agency world. Like, you know, if you're a solid software engineer, like I am always going to be able to have a role for you. Like I'm never. Um, I guess, yeah, it would be pretty bad to reach out to someone and be like, hey, I'm just seeing what's up and you don't have anything. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> be a moment where you're like, oh, yikes. Um, but if you do know, like there are some positions you can always hire for, like it's, it's important to keep that, keep that going. You are a very proactive sorcerer. That's what you are. You're proactive. I might be more reactive. That's, that's, that's everything that I do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, um, I mean, well, my whole job is sourcing, right? Yeah. So right. you gotta be, you, um, so yeah, I do, I mean, I mean, everyone does always get bogged down. It would be a lie to sit here and be like, yeah, I'm never busy. I'm never drowning under the weight of Rex. Um, cause you do need to learn how to manage your time. And sometimes it can be pretty challenging. Um, but I think there's always a way to like, sort of think, okay, how much time does this, does this stuff actually take? I'm going to block out half an hour for it um, just to keep in touch with folks. So if you don't have, and, and maybe are there certain, are, is there a certain position that objective paradigm really kind of is like, we're the go-to person for these type of roles. And then when you're in your time of luxurious <laughs> sourcing, <Right? laughs> and you're, and you're building your, your pipelining for the future. I love that phrase. I do We've got, I mean, where recruiters will do, will recruit, right? Um, and, but I think we're, we can always recruit software engineers. Um, we do, so we do a lot of work with people who are either in the FinTech space or startups who want to hire like they're in the FinTech space in Chicago. Um, so, you know, those uh, candidates that, you know, trading firms want, um, startups want, like that's really our sweet spot. Um, that said, so sometimes you're always like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go find something for, you know, what, what any of these clients might always like to look for. Um, but yeah, it's also just, you know, folks that I've had that <laughs> I've reached out to for something in the past. Um, I do, I like, I do, um, even if I am, you know, reaching out, like there are sometimes you see someone and you're like, okay, this is the school they've got and these are the languages they're working on. They're at these clients. Um, you, can, you know, you can always place them. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you're going to start your pipelining process. Um, what are, what would you say, like when you're sitting down, you're like, okay, I'm going to look for software engineers in the FinTech space. And what's the first place you go to the second place and the third place? You mean like, tools or just like what yeah, I like, like do you start on Twitter and do a couple of Twitter searches then you do then oh, jump very first down. place that I'm going to go oh yeah no very first place I'm going to go is always going to be my internal database um, I'm gonna go and look through you know who have we contacted who have we placed in the past who who has interviewed with us in the past that we haven't spoken to in a couple of years um, like if I have if I have some free time, that is the first place that I'm going to go um, because those are those are people who really do need to be reached out to. Um, 
then probably I'm going to go on Twitter and see if there's any cool conferences going and just start, start a conversation, see where that's going to go. Um, and then probably after that would be to events, you know, I find out about something that's happening through Twitter because people are talking about it. I'm going to go find the folks who are at the event, but not tweeting about it. Um, but yeah. On Twitter? Uh, so I would start on Twitter and then I would follow that just to the event. Um, so the event, see actually like on Eventbrite or something like that or. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and do you look for like, how do you find can other than the speakers and sometimes, sometimes they post who's actually attending, but usually they keep that, you know, conference developers keep that private. Um, yeah, I mean, I will try to see if I can find that. Um, I mean, a lot of companies or like if you ever, plan a conference with sked.com. Got to shout out Steve Levy there. That's uh, that's something that I learned from him. Um, but you can see, right, I love him. Um, but you can so sometimes see like, oh, here are the people who are attending the event. Um, and it's always worth checking that, right? Um, and then after that, you know, um, probably after that I would go, if that's not super productive, I would go find somewhere else. Um, Was there a but, tool you mentioned there? I don't think so. Um, oh, so sked. Oh. oh, so sked.com is the like a conference management site. It's sort of like Eventbrite. Um, oh. So they actually just have their attendees are searchable. So you can like look through and look at a session. It'll say twenty people are attending this session, and you can click and see the names of the twenty people. Okay. That's hat tip to Steve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and Dean DeCosta did a um, at one of our last conferences showed us how to do a search for candidates on meetup that I was just like, yes, right? Because finding, finding people who are part of groups and unless it's listed, um, like, you know, on Facebook, you can see the people who are part of the groups if you're a member, which is great. Um, but oftentimes on meetups or Eventbrite, you, you, that information is pretty private. And you can't you meet can't up. If you, uh, meet up if you join it, you can usually see the, the members. Um, if you join a meetup group, you can usually see it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they have made some changes. I know there's a search that I loved to use that was like on meetup and like member since, and they've made changes so that no longer works. Um, but you can sometimes still, still find folks through there. Um, a lot of times also I'll just go and like pick a random meetup event that someone would have gone to, um, especially if I'm doing that. You know, I'm looking for someone and I'm thinking like, okay, what were they doing five years ago? Like that's one where I'll go to a meetup five years ago and just message, just find folks through there. Um, and, and meetup has a messaging platform. I'm not sure if you knew um, or if you've yeah. ever used it. Uh, yeah. um, it's not the best and it doesn't, it, it um, often I've noticed it will block out my email address. Um, that's in in addition to sourcing, recruiting, all that fun stuff, I run a group called Queer Tech Club, which is organized on Meetup. So I am in and out of their Meetup, their messaging system every single day. Um, You're busy, but yeah, it's fun though. Yeah, I so the Core Tech Group. Do you host um, in-person meetups as well? Yeah, um, so it's all in person, um, and we just go to different companies around Chicago. Um, we're going to be doing one the day after a Midwest Tech Recruit, actually, on um, Objective Paradigm is hosting. Um, oh. So I'm really excited about that. Um, like but yeah, so it's usually that. we get 100 folks. Yeah, I might, I might shout that out. Um, but usually we get 100 folks in the room. Um, and, you know, it's food and drinks and networking. And it's been really amazingly successful. I've been helping run it for two years now. And it's just magical to see the growth we've had. And folks keep coming back like month after month after month. So I've made some real friends through it as well. I, uh, I was, I've not been to Chicago, Sarah. So I may have mentioned this to you that I was going to do a, like a Ferris Bueller's day off like on Thursday, the day after, oh, yeah. right? And just you know, because my I asked my husband's like, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You should watch that. That was actually filmed. I was like, that was filmed in Chicago. I had no idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, we're gonna work into the itinerary to come to your event. <laughs> <laughs> 
We're all going to come in the Awesome. Room. We'd love to have, have you. Pizza and, and being at pubs all day. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be perfect. I mean, that's the way to see if we can go. Um, yeah. Okay. So you're going to be speaking at Midwest Tech Recruit September 18th. Tell us about what you'll be speaking on. Yeah, so like, like you said, I'll be speaking at Midwest Tech Recruit on September 18th. I'm going to be talking about sourcing at scale. So how do you manage to uh, continue finding candidates, reaching out to candidates, um, all of those fun things, and you know, sometimes spending a lot of time working on um, finding contact information or crafting that perfect message. Uh, all of that stuff takes a lot of time. How do you do that quickly and uh, at enough volume that you can actually get people in touch, get in touch with people and make hires. That's what it's all about. Um, so you can expect to take away some actual strategies for how you can combine all of this, you know, targeted outreach with, you know, doing enough of it to actually do your job. I'm really excited. Oh, we're excited to have you. It's going to be a fantastic presentation. Um, and I, I think that I can't, I can't think of anybody who would be better to present on that with all the experience that you have, and um, especially the amount of people who have uh, recommended you speak at this conference. So we're very excited to have you. And then I guess we'll see you in Chicago. And if anybody wants to get hold of you, Sarah, how can they reach you? Um, through Twitter, probably, at Sarah E. Goldberg. Um, and then... Um, I feel like anyone who's attending a sourcing conference should be able to guess my email address, but it's sgoldberg at oprecruiting.com if you ever need it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being part of the Tech Recruit Podcast. You have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.